morning everybody I want to talk today about the power of positivity and just how powerful our minds are in looking for positivity everywhere I remember Tony Robbins saying that whatever we focus on that's where energy flows so where focus goes energy flows and energy your thought your ability to think is the greatest form of energy in the universe so think about that and let's apply it today look for positivity everywhere be relentless wherever you are whatever you're experiencing whoever you're with look for the positive it is not being blind to reality it is taking your powerful mind and actually focusing on what's positive in this world because there's so much that's positive you do that and that power of your positivity is endless and it will affect endless others so i challenge you now and forever to do it have a great day everybody. At a compound in Mountain View, California, internet billionaire Naveen Jain is hatching a plan that could make him the world's first trillionaire. Naveen, good to see you, my friend. Good. So, Naveen, the team is working hard as it usually is. So, we're going to land on the moon somewhere around here, close to where the Apollo spacecraft landed at the equator. How did you pick that area? Well, it's first of all, it's on the near side, so it's easily accessible from Earth. It's an area, the dark area are actually regions of lava plains, so they're not mountainous. Not so long ago, it was the Soviet and America superpowers that were locked in a race to land on the moon. Now it's Bob and Naveen who are leading the competition to mine precious metals from its surface. Are we still on track to land on the moon by 2015? We're still on track, Naveen. Initially, we thought the mission was going to cost us about $100 million. Do you think we can bring the cost down to, say, 50 to $60 million now? Yeah, even less. Yeah, even I, less? I think the first mission will be under 50, and subsequent missions may be under 40. When would we be able to tell your honey that I want to take you to the moon? 10 years. 10 years. Not only will it be a honeymoon, but I can take you my honey to the moon, and I think that'll be the killer. If you can do that, that's real business. <laughs> If we can go to the moon for $50 million and the cost comes down to 20 and we're able to bring back the things worth $500 billion, I don't care what anybody says, that's a great business. Somebody is going to create a trillion dollar industry in space and we sure hope it's us. When you tell somebody what you're doing and they don't think it's a crazy idea, then you're thinking too small. So when you walk up to a party and people say, what do you do? Well, I mine the moon. Well, that's, that's crazy. Well, I'm thinking big, right? Honestly, I think we're all thinking small. You're thinking small, I'm thinking small. We're all thinking small compared to what we're, what we're capable of. And I think we've been conditioned to think small. We've been conditioned by our upbringing, our family, our, our parents, our guidance counselors, our teachers, our We've just been conditioned to think small because we're learning about life from people who also never thought big. And so because we are products of our environment, we have conditioned ourselves to think the same way as the people in our environment. And if you're not happy with your environment and your environment is not around, uh, around big people who've done amazing things or thinking big, then you will stay stuck thinking small as well. What I love about Naveen Jain is that he thinks big. You know, the first time I found his content, there were three people who I get recommended all the time. You should do a top 10 on this person. You should do an espresso on this person. You should profile this person. And there were three people who, for the first time, upon first consumption of their content, really blew me away. One was Denzel Washington. Uh, if you have not seen Denzel Washington, you should go watch his top 10. He, his backup plan for his life was being a minister, uh, and he is a fire presenter. I just kind of, a lot of times when we do actors, it's really hard to get anything good out of the interviews that they're doing. Uh, but Denzel Washington is a whole other animal, so he really blew me away. The second was Priyanka Chopra, uh, who had a just amazing set of interviews and super intelligent, bright woman. Uh, and the third was Naveen Jain, where I'd like, no idea who this person is. You should do Naveen Jain. Great. Go look him up. I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. I want more Naveen Jain in my life. 
I think that's a great sign, you know, like when you find people like that, even if you've never met them and up until this year, I had never met Naveen Jain. I had the good fortune to just recently have him on, on my channel to do an interview and a collaboration. But up until that point, I'd never met him before. And when you find the people who make you think bigger, who make you feel more confident, who make you feel more bold, be around them more. This is my solution, right? I am trying to hang out, even if it's just virtually, with the people who inspire me to want to play a bigger game. You know, either those three people, I haven't met Denzel Washington yet. I haven't met Priyanka Chopra yet. Uh, and up until, you know, this year, I hadn't met Naveen Jain yet, but I can still be inspired by them. I can still learn from them. I can still look at their content and they can still push me to become better. And I think a lot of us stay stuck and stay small because it's so good to feel important and we end up being the big fish in a small pond if you're watching this video you are probably the one that's pouring into everybody else you're probably the most optimistic person in your circle you're probably the one who cares the most about the people around you you're probably doing the most for the people in your circle and you're the one people come to and say hey how do i x you know how do i grow how do i get better how do i you know, you're the one that's advising and helping and pushing other people maybe pushing them too much <laughs> that makes sense maybe you're maybe you're pushing some people too much but you're the most optimistic most ambitious person in your circle probably that's great in a sense in that you can pour and give back and help others along the way but who's pushing you you know, if you don't have somebody pushing you to be better, to be stronger, to be greater, to be more ambitious, to think bigger, then you probably won't. Like if you, it's really uncomfortable to think bigger. And if you don't have somebody inspiring you, pushing you, helping you, then you probably stay stuck. And that's what we need to change. And so it's a message for you, but it's, it's a message for me equally so. And so step one in doing that, I think, is just changing the environment to be around the people who do inspire you. And chances are most of the people who do inspire you are not not people who have you have direct access to and not people who are taking on an intern. You know, Warren Buffett's not taking on an intern to go live with him for a year, as far as I know. So how do you do it? Well, the easy way is through content. I, I've learned so much and been inspired so much by just amazing people through the content on my own channel like I make these videos for me because I need them because I need to believe more in myself and then I share that with you and thankfully enough of you like it that I can make it a business and hire a team and continue to make even more content because if it was just me then it'd be <laughs> a lot fewer videos coming up and a lot less profiles and a lot less content so being around the people and when you find people who really speak to you who really get you going who like yes this is exactly what i need then be around them more subscribe to their channels buy their books listen to their podcasts be around them more if they're speaking at an event go to the event because it'll, it'll push you to reach another level and this is why it's so great to have so many people now i'm i'm passionate about helping bring new people onto the to platforms like youtube and getting their message out there because some people will push you through things. Some people will hug you through things. Everybody has their own lens and you'll connect with people in a different way. So you look at a uh, Eric Thomas, or you look at a uh, Jocko Willink, or you look at a uh, Andy Frisella who are going to be very in your face, cut right to the truth. No BS, no excuses, no wiggle room, like get up and go chase down your life. You know, it's a hard push. They may be yelling at you. They're very intense. It's a hard push forward. And then there'll be other people like Oprah, like um, Brene Brown, like Dave Meltzer, who have a different approach. It's a much softer approach. They'll hug you through it. You know, some people will push you and yell at you to get through it. And some people will hug you through it. A lot of times the message is exactly the same. You know, Oprah's message is very similar to Eric Thomas's message. The difference is the delivery. Oprah will hug you through it and Eric will push you through it. And it really just depends on what you need. There's no right or wrong. It's just, what do you need? And when you find the people who give you what you need, just be around it more, be around it more. Because no matter how much you watch 
one video, the impact will wear off, right? Like you're waking up tomorrow, the same person you were almost yesterday, maybe a half a percent better. But you could be, you could watch this video, get all inspired, be like, yes, all right, I'm going to chase things down. Amazing. Let's go. And you have energy for a few hours for the day, but then you wake up tomorrow and, and that energy is gone, right? Has that happened to you? That energy suddenly is not there anymore. You don't feel as bold, as courageous or ambitious as you were yesterday. Why? What happened? It's not that there's nothing wrong with you. That's just normal because you got an injection into your environment that took you to another level and then it, it fell off because there was no consistency in the environment. So you are what you consistently do. So whatever you want to accomplish, whoever you want to be, to consistently surround yourself with people like that, because you're not getting enough in your home environment. Your home, your environment now, your life has been perfectly designed to keep you where you are. It's allowed you to get to where you are right now. Amazing. And, and if that's where all you want to be, awesome. Congratulations. You've done it. You've, you've hit the jackpot. But if you want more, then your current environment is not designed to help you go and get more. And again, I'm talking to myself just as much as I'm talking to you. Like saying the words out loud. It's like, what changes do I need to make to my environment? Who, who do I need to be hanging out with more, either in person or just through the video content to make me want to push more, be more courageous, say, say, bolder things and have bigger aspirations and goals and dreams and and take bolder action towards accomplishing them right makes a big 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 difference and so if you want to accomplish something if it's business success or mindset success then you know, if it's just thinking bigger then if you love Naveen Jain be around Naveen Jain more watch all his interviews and, and listen to any inter uh, podcast that he does and I did one on my main channel. We'll link that up at the end of this video. You can go watch if you want. If you want to improve your health and fitness and you're tired of, you know, being on an Oreo diet, okay, you can make a choice and a decision that I'm going to, I want to be this person. I want to be the person who works out. I want to be the person who takes care of my body, takes care of my health and energy. And that's awesome as a decision, but you need the environment to support you. And so now if you're subscribing to health channels, if you're subscribing, following people on Instagram who are working out and take care of their bodies, it will make you want to live a healthier life. One of the ones that I love watching is Tom Bilyeu and his health uh, theory show where he's interviewing experts around health. And every time I listen, I was listening to one this morning, every time I listen, watch, it makes me want to be a little bit healthier. You know, and the more that you're around that kind of stuff, the more you will take on the mindset. Similarly, if you're injecting poison, like if you're around negative people or you're consuming negative content, and that's most of the news and most of media, to be honest, is mostly negative. If you're surrounded by negativity constantly and you're you're watching negative videos and reading negative news constantly, you will be you'll be a lot more scared. You'll be a lot more scarcity mindset. You'll be a lot more afraid. You'll be a lot less positive and ambitious because that's what you're feeding into your mind. So. Be very careful about now designing and engineering your environment. Your environment has happened to you. You know, you've had some control over it, but it's it's mostly happened to you. And now you can, with intent, change it to be more positive. If you, if you had to ask yourself, if I wanted to surround myself with the most positive, encouraging, inspiring people who will make me more courageous, bold and ambitious, who would those people be? What would that environment look like? And then make a choice, change it. Change who you subscribe to, change what you're listening and watching, unsubscribe from all the channels that make you feel worse about yourself, change your physical environment. What, what clothes are you wearing? What do you put on the wall around you? What's your background on your cell phone and on your computer? You start to change it. And when you change your environment, it'll force the change in your habits, in your mindset, and in your thinking. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there.
If you want to see my one-on-one -on -one with Naveen, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Self-belief comes from self-love, right? The minute you fall in love with yourself is the day the world will fall in love. morning everybody today Jack Ma ends off his top 10 rules for success with us and his last one is one that stands out for me it's have passion this is one that is the activating force in anything great that people have ever done that you can ever do you have to have passion it has to be so in you that you love it that you breathe it that you think it Think about your loved ones. Think about the people you love most in this world. Think about something you've ever loved most in this world. It could be something like, I don't know, playing a video game or anything. Something that has such a powerful force. If you can have that passion and apply it to something that is worthwhile in serving others, there is no limit to what you can do. My passion is spreading as much positivity in this world. Where I stand, where I am, with the help of everybody. So I use Jack Ma's thoughts. I hope you do for now and forever. Have a great day, everybody. In my book, I really hold out people in recovery from severe addiction as sort of modern day prophets for the rest of us, because I do think that people who have been addicted and then go get into recovery do have a hard won wisdom um, that we can all benefit from. And, and the wisdom, I guess, you know, to distill it down, I mean, it's it's many things. But in terms of you know, dopamine, the, the wisdom is there are adaptive ways to get your dopamine and there are less than adaptive ways. And in general, um, you could describe the adaptive ways as not too potent, so not tipping that balance too hard or too fast to the side of pleasure. So does that mean never allowing myself to be absolutely in complete bliss? Or does it mean not allowing myself to stay in that state too long? The latter. I think the latter. So, and th then that gets to temperament. So I'm going to get that to a second. So, so in general, what we want is some kind of flexibility in that balance and the ability to re easily reassert homeostasis. We don't want to break our balance, which is possible if we overindulge for enough period of time and end up with a balance tip to the side of pain, this dopamine deficit state we've been talking about. We want to, we want a flexible, resilient balance, right? Which can be sensitive to things going on in the environment, which can experience pleasure and approach, which can experience pain and recoil, right? This is all adaptive and healthy and necessary and good. We would never want a balance that doesn't tilt, right? But that would be a disaster. Right. We wouldn't be human. Um, and we wouldn't want that. It'd be really, really boring. On the other hand, what people in recovery from addiction talk about is to some extent having to learn to live with things being a little boring a lot of the time, right? So trying to avoid some of this intensity and thrill seeking and escapism that really is at the core of addictive tendencies. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but when yes. you say boring, um, can we add stressful and boring? Yes. So anxiety and boredom can hang out together, right? Mm -hmm. Am I mm -hmm. correct? In, oh, in, for sure. I mean, okay. actually boredom is highly anxiety provoking. Okay, that's good to know because I yeah. think people hear boredom and yeah. they think, like, oh, there's nothing to do here. Right. It, there's not, it's right. Usually, I feel like we have a ton to do. We just don't really want to do it. Right. As opposed right. to something that we're excited to do. Right. Okay. So, so the, this gets to sort of some of the core things also we were talking about earlier about finding your passion. So I'm going to try to link it all mm -hmm. together. Um, but, but basically is boredom. First of all, boredom is a rare experience for modern humans. 
because we're constantly distracting ourselves from the present moment and we have an infinite number of ways to do that, right? Um, but boredom is really, I think, an important and necessary experience. But it is scary because when you allow yourself to be bored, um, let's say you were had that list of all the things you hate to do and you actually got them all done. Imagine that. And you got your forthcoming book done huh. and you did all your interviews. <laughs> no, no, no. And, it and could then, happen. Lightning could strike. Right. And you yeah. walked your dog and you cleaned your house and you went shopping. Imagine that for a moment. You would be sitting in your house and my guess is you would be terrified because, wow, what am I supposed to do now, right? There's nothing I really have to do. And that is really, really scary. That can feel like free fall. And yet that's really an important and good experience to have. And I think that is an experience out of which we can have a lot of creative um, initiative, but also really consider our priorities and values. Okay, here I am on planet Earth. What the hee-haw am I going to do with my life? What do I really care about? How do I really want to spend my time when I'm not distracting myself, you know, in order to, to spend it? Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Anna Lemke, and my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, have a balance. How often I grab my phone to distract me from difficult times, whether it's serious life challenges, I'll look at it because I don't want to deal with that in this present moment from minor life challenges, like something scary on TV. I grab my phone because I don't want to look at it. And so, you know, and you talk about all the different instances like escaping drugs, alcohol, romance novels, binge watching Netflix, whatever it is that we do. Why does this only make our challenges in life worse that we're not able to be in the present moment? Yeah, great question. I think to really understand why we need to pay attention to this problem and why it's non-trivial. Um, is to understand the neuroscience of pleasure and pain. And the way that I explain this to my patients and to my medical students is, is I say, imagine that um, in your brain, there's a balance, kind of like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground. And in its resting state, unlike a teeter-totter in a kid's playground, that balance is level with the ground. That balance represents how our brain processes pleasure and pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. When we do something pleasurable or reinforcing, let's say in my case, I eat a piece of chocolate, my balance tilts slightly to the side of pleasure. I get a little release of dopamine, our pleasure neurotransmitter in the brain, and I feel good. But one of the overriding rules governing this balance is that it wants to stay level. It doesn't want to remain very long to the side of pleasure or the side of pain. So the brain will immediately respond to that or adapt to it by down-regulating our own dopamine production and down-regulating our own dopamine transmission. I kind of imagine this as these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. But the gremlins like it on the balance, so they stay on till it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain, and that's the after effect the come down, the hangover, that moment of wanting one more piece of chocolate. Now, if we wait long enough, the gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored and we're back at our sort of level set point for experiencing pleasure and pain, and that's fine, then we move on. But if we continue to tap our phones or watch you know, Netflix or read romance novels or eat more chocolate, we eventually end up with so many gremlins on the pain side of the balance that they could fill this whole room. And when we've reached that point, we've essentially changed our set point for experiencing pleasure and pain, such that we need more and more of the pleasurable stimulus and more potent forms to get the same effect. And importantly, when we're not ingesting that pleasurable substance, our balance is tilted sharply to the side of pain, we experience the universal symptoms of withdrawal, anxiety, irritability, restlessness, insomnia, mental preoccupation with our drug. And it can stay like that 
for a very, very long time. So this is not just about tolerance and needing more to get the same effect. It's about the fact that when we're not using, we are essentially in a dopamine deficit state, right? We're walking around unhappy. I see so many patients coming in reporting depression, anxiety, insomnia, wanting me to help them. One of the first interventions that I make is to have them eliminate their drug of choice, whatever it is, for one month. And I warn them they're, they're going to feel worse before they feel better because it'll be the pleasure pain balance tilted here. But if they can just abstain for long enough, those neuroadaptation gremlins will hop off the balance and homeostasis will be restored and they'll again be able to take pleasure in life's more modest rewards. So ultimately the thesis of Dopamine Nation is that both as individuals and as a larger society, we have inundated ourselves with so much dopamine that we've reset our pleasure pain pathways to the side of pain, making it harder for us to experience pleasure and more likely that we will experience pain. Rule number three, understand the gateway effect. This is just one of many typical examples of cases that I have seen in my career. And you'll note this one was in 2017. Uh, this was a 28-year-old male. Uh, he had a diagnosis of chronic pain. There was no known disease or tissue damage to, ex to explain his pain, but nonetheless, he had pain from the tops of his top of his head to the tips of his toes. And he was on the following regimen prescribed to him by his very purportedly very nice, and I believe it, well-educated primary care doctor. 40 milligrams of Opana, an opioid, twice a day, 30 milligrams of Dilaudid, an opioid, once a day, 60 milligrams of Oxycodone, an opioid, once a day, 20 milligrams of Valium, a benzodiazepine, once a day, 65 milligrams of phenobarbital, a sedative, 30 milligrams of temazepam, once a day, and no list would be complete without eight milligrams of Xanax, once a day. So this young man with no known disease etiology, other than the endorsement of having a severe chronic pain, which I believe he has, is at imminent risk uh, for overdose death with this regimen. Uh, and it, just to kind of put that in perspective, he's on 470 morphine milligram equivalents daily. The average heroin addicted person takes about approximately 100 morphine milligram equivalents daily. So all of this prescribed by, the doc by a doctor, a good doctor, a well-educated doctor, and sanctioned by our modern healthcare system. Now we're in what's been called the second and third waves of the epidemic. What you'll see here is that approximately around uh, 2013 or so, there was a spike in heroin-related overdose deaths. By the way, you'll note here, this is prescription opioid-related deaths, which has plateaued. I mean, maybe even gone down slightly, but is still pretty darn high, right? And then you have this spike in heroin, and then right here, synthetic opioids, especially fentanyl, which we know is 50 to 100 times more potent uh, than, than heroin is. So what happened? How do we understand this? Basically, the first way to understand this is the gateway effect, that essentially Vicodin, Oxycontin, Percocet got folks addicted, and the natural progression of addiction is that people look for more and more potent sources, and cheaper sources, price point really matters when people become addicted, and so they've gone from prescription opioids to illicit sources as those became cheaper and more available. Also partially explaining this is the fact that as we have pulled back on opioid prescribing, individuals can now no longer get the opioids that they used to get for their, for them, their Some of those individuals are now going to the illicit market. And then of course, very importantly, the tsunami effect, right? Just the fact that all of those pills are in all of those medicine cabinets means that for some vulnerable teenagers, they just really have to get one prescription and try it once. And then they're off and running to illicit sources. Uh, so unfortunately, what we're seeing is that doctors, fearful of repercussions for opioid prescribing in the context of this epidemic, are now no longer being willing to treat 
some patients with pain. This was a study that was done where there was a confederate who pretended to be the child of a, an older person with pain who called the Michigan Primary Care Clinic and said, will you treat my father or my mother? They're on this opioid regimen. 40% of primary care clinics in Michigan said, we're not gonna treat uh, your, your parent. We won't even see them as a patient. So this is part of the repercussion. Uh, it's gotten so bad. As you can see here, this is just another example of the fact that many high school students who get addicted to prescription opioids uh, started with uh, a prescription from their doctor. And here's an interesting statistic. In the 1960s, 80% of heroin users started with heroin. Today, if you interview heroin users, 75% of them will tell you that they started with a prescription opioid. Again, a very different phenomenology in terms of this epidemic. Okay, so what I wanna do next is delve a little bit more deeply into how this happened. Rule number four, challenge the anxiety. You've got this, um, it's a chart that has chocolate, sex, nicotine, um, amphetamines on it. Um, it talks about how much dopamine is released with chocolate versus sex and drugs. And you also see that learning increases dopamine firing in the brain. So I wonder where do healthier habits like learning or exercise fit into this chart? And should we be cautious of too much learning or too much exercise? Do we get the surplus with healthy things as well? Yeah, great question. So, so how do we differentiate good dopamine from bad dopamine or healthy adaptive sources of dopamine from less healthy or adaptive sources? Um, the chart you're referring to has to do with an experiment where they placed a probe in a rat's brain to figure out how much dopamine is released in the rat's brain when it ingests certain substances. And um, you know, dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which means it's a, it's a molecule in the brain that's intimately associated with pleasure, reward, and motivation. Neurotransmitters are the molecules that bridge the synapse between two neurons. So neurons communicate through electrical signals, but they don't touch end to end. There's a little gap, and that's to be able to regulate and control those signals. And that gap is bridged by little chemicals that are called neurotransmitters. Dopamine is probably the most important neurotransmitter involved in reward motivation and pleasure. It's not the only neurotransmitter, but it's probably the final common pathway. So measuring dopamine in a rat's brain with ingestion of certain substances gives some idea of how reinforcing that substance is. And as you saw, we, we all have tonic baseline amounts of dopamine firing in our brain. So it's not as if we have no dopamine and then we get dopamine. We're always firing a little bit of dopamine and it's how dopamine changes either above or below baseline firing that creates our emotional states. When dopamine goes above baseline, that's the feeling of pleasure motivation, reward. When dopamine goes below baseline, that's the feeling of craving, irritability, anxiety, restlessness. And what that, that experiment showed is that chocolate increases um, dopamine firing above baseline about 50 units. Sex is about 100 units. Um, nicotine, I think, is 150. Cocaine is 250. And amphetamine is 1,000. So you get some sort of sense of sort of relative um, reinforcing potential of those different drugs. Now, importantly, there's also this idea of a drug of choice. So what makes your dopamine go up to 100 might not make my dopamine levels go up to 100. So there's also that inter-individual variability. But getting to your question about sort of exercise or learning, these are activities that are not immediately releasing dopamine with the sti initial stimulus, they, they come as sort of an after effect, which is why I talk about pressing on the pain side of the balance in order to reset our pleasure pathways to the pleasure side. So remember repeatedly pressing on the pleasure side has the gremlins hopping on the pain side and basically resets our, our thresholds to the side of pain. But if we intentionally engage in challenging, painful or anxiety provoking activities, that is, we press on the pain side, then those same neuroadaptation gremlins will hop on the pleasure side to bring us ultimately to this point. So that's the good kind of dopamine. And typically that means, in, you know, again, in small doses, doing things that are hard. Learning is usually effortful and hard. 
Um, exercise is usually effortful and hard. Um, exposing ourselves to things that we're afraid of is effortful and hard. And all of that in small doses um, is good for us because then you don't get your dopamine from the initial stimulus, you get it from the opponent process stimulus. And one of the other um, you know, experiments that I talk about in the book, which is kind of horrific to read because you know, it's very inhumane to, to dogs, and it was done some time ago, but to me, it's, it's a really fascinating experiment. Basically, they took dogs and they exposed them to a very strong electrical shock. So they pressed down very hard on the pain side of the balance. And initially, after the initial response, you know, the dog was sort of wary and alarmed, and, you know, defecated and urinated on itself, kind of horrible. But what's really fascinating is that with the second exposure of the shock, the brain compensated by tipping the balance of the side of pleasure and the dog exhibited a what the, what the researchers called a fit of joy right after being released from from the 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 electrical harness the dog bounced up and down was happy you know was and that's that's not just like oh thank goodness you know i'm no longer being shocked that's actually a physiologic reaction to a stressor, that there's this opponent process reaction or this counter effect leading to, you know, euphoria and dopamine. It's the same thing people get a runner's high or what have you. Now, is it possible to overdo painful stimuli to get addicted to exercise? Absolutely. And I see patients like that who run so much or exercise so much that they end up injured and yet keep going. That's a situation where you have too much of a good thing, even if it's, you know, sort of a painful stimulus can be bad. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, don't overindulge. When we find something or when something finds us <laughs> that we enjoy, that feels pleasurable, uh, social media, food, right. sex, gambling, whatever mm -hmm. happens to be, and we will explore the full range of these. There's a some dopamine release when we engage right. in that behavior. Mm -hmm. And then what you're telling me is that very quickly, yes, and beneath my conscious awareness, mm -hmm. there's a tilting back of the scale where pleasure is reduced by way of increasing pain. Right. And I've heard you say before that the pain mechanism has some competitive advantages over the pleasure mechanism such that it doesn't just bring the scale back to level mm. it actually brings pain higher mm. than pleasure mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit more about that yeah yeah so uh, so what happens again so the 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 hallmark of any addictive substance or behavior is that it releases a lot of dopamine in our brain's reward pathway like right like broccoli just doesn't release a lot of dopamine just doesn't right but what happens right after i do something that is really pleasurable and releases a lot of dopamine is again my brain is going to immediately compensate by down-regulating my own dopamine receptors, my own dopamine transmission to compensate for that, okay? And that's that come down or the hangover, or that after effect, that moment of wanting to do it more. Now, if I just wait for that feeling to pass, then my dopamine will re-regulate itself and I'll go back to whatever my chronic baseline is. But if I don't wait, and here's really the key, if I keep indulging again and again and again, ultimately, I have, I have so much on the pain side, right, that I've essentially reset my brain to what we call like an anhedonic or lacking in joy type of state, which is a dopamine deficit state. So that's really the, the, the way in which pain can become the main driver is because I've indulged so much in these high reward behaviors or substances that my brain has had to compensate by way down regulating my own dopamine such that 
even when I'm not doing that drug, I'm in a dopamine deficit state, which is akin to a clinical depression. I, I have anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and a lot of mental preoccupation with using again or getting the drug. And so that, that's the piece there. There's the single use, which easily passes, but it's the chronic use that can then reset really our dopamine thresholds and then nothing is enjoyable mm -hmm. right that then everything sort of pales in comparison to this one drug that i want to keep doing rule number six don't monetize the work i could also say that someone who enjoys working as well is that the same thing you get addicted to the stress of your job is it the same idea yeah i mean Absolutely. So, I mean, again, I think being very engaged in your work and finding meaning and purpose in your work can be a really good source of dopamine. But anything that leads to you know, that kind of reinforcement loop has the potential to become addictive. And one of the points of Dopamine Nation is the way that technology has made all of these behaviors, including work, potentially more potent and hence more addictive. So for example, the way that we're now measured um, in the metrics used for work are often remote from the meaning of the work itself. Uh, so for example, you know, we may, for example, in, in medicine, we actually get metrics telling us how many patient hours we've billed and how much above our target and we get graphs and all of a sudden you can begin to monetize that experience in a way that's in and of itself reinforcing that is separate from the actual reason for doing the work in the first place. And that can then lead to this kind of vicious cycle of compulsive over-engagement or addiction. Rule number seven, look around you. One of the big problems now that's very misguided about this idea of finding your passion, it's almost as if people are looking to fit the key into the lock of the thing that was meant for them to do. Right. And then everything will feel like a natural progression. Right. And then everything will be wonderful. Yeah, I can attest to the fact that is not how it works yeah. in any endeavor. Right. And it's that you'll have all this great success or, you know, but, and here, here's where I really think the answer lies. And I really, really believe this. Stop looking for your passion and instead look around right where you are. Stop distracting yourself. Look around right where you are and see what needs to be done. So not what do I want to do, but what is the work that needs to be done? And more importantly, it doesn't have to be some grandiose work. Like, does the garbage need to be taken out, right? Is there some garbage on your neighbor's lawn that someone threw there that you could actually bend over and pick up and put into the garbage can? Look around you. There is so much work that needs to be done that nobody wants to do that is really, really important. And if we all did that, I really think the world would be a much better place. And this is what people who have severe addiction who get into recovery realize. They're like, it's not about me and my will and what I'm going to will in my life or in the world. It's about looking around what needs to be done. What is the work that I am called to do in this moment? which also is incredibly freeing because I don't have to search for the perfect thing. There's a lot of burden now on young people that they have to find that perfect thing. And until they've found that perfect thing, they're going to be miserable. You don't have to do that. Look at the life you were given. Look at the people around you. Look at the jobs that present themselves to you and do that job simply and honorably one day at a time. In a, with a kind of humility. I think this is really what, what's so striking to me about the wisdom of people in recovery. There's this incredible humility that comes out of that experience. You feel so broken, so ashamed, but you pick yourself up one day at a time and you build a life that's around, what can I do right in this moment that might benefit another person and thereby benefit me? Rule number eight, watch the cravings. What motivates the drug-seeking patient? For me, what was really revelatory when I first started learning about addiction was to learn something about the neuroscience of addiction and how the brain changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to condense like the last 50 years of addiction neuroscience into three minutes at a level at which I understand it. It will become immediately apparent that I'm not a neuroscientist, but here we go. One of the most interesting things that we've learned in the past 50 years 
about pain and pleasure is that they're co-located. So the same areas of the brain that process pleasure are the areas that process pain. And the way that pain and pleasure interrelate is that they work like a balance, okay? So I really like chocolate, so when I take, ingest a piece of chocolate, my balance tips slightly to the side of pleasure. But here's the thing about the balance. It wants to remain level, and it will work very hard to reestablish a level balance, or what is called homeostasis. And it does that through a process called neuroadaptation. Now, I kind of imagine neuroadaptation as these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of my balance to bring it level again. And that's that moment of wanting a second piece of chocolate because the thing about the gremlins is they like it on the balance. They don't hop off as soon as it's level, but they wait till the balance is tipped an equal and opposite amount to this side of pain. Again, that's where I'm thinking, mm, another piece of chocolate would be really good right now. If I wait long enough, the gremlins hop off, the balance reasserts homeostasis, and I'm not really craving another piece of chocolate. That's how it works, okay? Now imagine that instead of a piece of chocolate, my doctor gives me some Vicodin. And by the way, I'm in pain, so I'm not even starting out with a level balance, right? I'm starting out tilted to the side of pain. But the balance works the same way. Now I don't get a little bit of shift to the side of pleasure, I get a great big shift, huge amount of dopamine in my reward pathway. The fundamental difference between substances that are addictive and those that are not is the amount of dopamine that they release in the reward pathway. So now I need a great big Arnold Schwarzenegger sized gremlin on the pain side to bring my balance level again. But remember, it doesn't stay there. It slams down to the side of pain. That is called opioid withdrawal. It's extremely painful for some people. But you know, it lasts hours to days. Depending on how many opioids you took, the gremlin hops off and homeostasis reasserts itself. Now here is the key piece to understanding the disease of addiction. If I take that opioid for days to weeks to months to years, I have enough gremlins on the pain side of my balance to fill this entire auditorium, right? Because now my balance is working really hard to adapt to all those exogenous opioids. So if I can't get more opioids, if I decide my life is a mess, I wanna stop, guess what? I slam down to the side of pain and it doesn't just take hours or days for those gremlins to hop off, it takes weeks to months to years. And this is what we call craving. I am now walking around with this type of balance. I'm irritable, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm maybe even suicidal, I can't sleep. My life is a lot better. I got my job back, I got my kids back, I got my husband back, but I feel like crap, right? Theoretically, if I wait long enough, the gremlins hop off and I get a level balance and I can enjoy a piece of chocolate again. But maybe for some people, that doesn't ever happen, which is where we get this idea that we can use opioids to treat opioid addiction in some cases. Rule number nine, try the 30-day dopamine fast. Being aware of what's pushing us too far is important. And then when you say, when you find something that pushes you too far, you try your 30-day fast. And then can you explain your dopamine acronym that you have um, so that we know how to go through the steps? Sure, so I mean, I think the first step, the, the D of dopamine stands for data. And that's just trying to be very honest with ourselves about what is the behavior or the substance that we have a conflicted relationship with. Either it's led to problems in our lives or we just know we're consuming too much of it um, or spending too much time getting it or thinking about it or covering it up. Um, and then be re being really honest with ourselves about exactly what the data are, you know, how, how often are we using it? How much are we using? What are we using? Um, you know, what are, what, what's the consumption level? And the O of the dopamine acronym stands for objectives. Why do we use? What does it do for us? Does it numb us? Does it give us pleasure? Uh, does it help with depression? Does it help us sleep? You know, what, what is the thing that's, that's driving our use? The P of dopamine stands for problems associated with use. So then being really honest with ourselves, like what, 
what is it that's not working? Maybe it worked initially and it's not working anymore because of this pleasure pain balance, or maybe it's still kind of working, but now we're lying about it or our spouse is unhappy with it, or we're not able to be present for our children in the way that we wanna be. And then the A of dopamine stands for abstinence, where we basically do a dopamine fast. We take a break from that substance or behavior for one month. Now, one month is the ideal because typically it takes about 10 to 14 days for acute withdrawal to resolve, for the gremlins to, to start to hop off the pain side of the balance and for homeostasis to be restored. Um, and that's why I, I, I say a month, because by the time folks get to week three or four, they're really noticing the benefits of not using. And that's the key to get past that initial withdrawal and get to that point where you're like, ah, you know, I, I get it now. I was totally hooked and I didn't see it. Um, but if you can't do a month because of, you know, work or whatever the circumstances is, you can't totally eliminate the device, for example, maybe just eliminate the apps that are that are causing difficulty or some aspect of it that's causing difficulty and or maybe just eliminate it for a single day. I mean, even, you know, a digital Sabbath one day a week can be really instructive for folks. And then just quickly, the rest of the acronym, the M stands for mindfulness. That means really just sitting with those uncomfortable and restless feelings when we're in acute withdrawal and noticing but not trying to change those feelings, not trying to reach for something to get rid of that feeling. This is a really hard thing to do. Um, the I of dopamine stands for insight. This is where we become aware of just how addicted we, we are or we were, something that's really hard to do when we're in it. Um, the N stands for next step. So if we make it that full month, then we think about, okay, do I want to continue to abstain or do I want to go back to using and if so, how do I want to use? Most of my patients want to go back to using their drug of choice. They want to use less. They want to use differently. So this is where we talk about self-binding strategies and specific barriers that we can put in place um, so that we don't get caught up in that cycle of compulsive overconsumption. And then, you know, when we give it a try, uh, and that's the E of the dopamine, that's the experiment part. We, we say to ourselves, okay, I'm, I'm not going to drink at home. I'm only going to drink with friends. I'm only going to drink wine. I'm only going to have one glass. And we just see if we can do it. And, you know, then a month later, sort of collect the data again and, and start again. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is avoid dependence. Do you think uh, if, if you're giving somebody something at a high enough dose over a long enough period of time, it's possible to addict anyone to almost anything? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I do think so. Um, you know, and certainly it, most people, for example, who take an opioid like a Vicodin or Oxycontin or a Norco, who take that daily will develop physiologic dependence on that, such that if they try to decrease it or stop it, they'll go into withdrawal. Now, physical dependence and addiction are not exactly the same thing, but there's a very high correlation between those two things. And in terms of what's going on in the brain, it's not really clear if there's a difference or what that difference might be. Morning, guys. Uh, again, I'm going to borrow from Les Brown. He, as you can see, he's got an amazing sense of humor as I'm drawing a lot of my material to remind us to laugh our way to infinite mind wealth. Les Brown, thank you so much. Here's another example. Uh, he was talking about money at one point, and uh, you know, we often have, we don't even realize it, but we self sabotage ourselves and uh, with the idea that money is the root of all evil, when in fact, it's the uh, love of money that's the root of all evil. Well, he was giving an example where um, he was uh, talking in a speech and he said something about uh, how um, most people believe that rich people or people with a lot of money can't be happy. And then he says the example, well, he goes, I'd rather find out for myself. I'd rather 
become rich and find out for myself if I can be happy. So he puts a positive laughing spin on it. And I thought, yeah, we got to look at ourselves that way when it comes to money. So yeah, we'd rather find out for ourselves. Let's get rich and find out if we can be happy. Have a great day, everybody. Harvard did a recent study on 3,000 leaders, managers, individuals working inside organizations, and they looked at the top performing ones and they wondered and asked, what was the number one skill they had? And it came down to this one word, associating. The ability to connect dots where people usually see differences. The ability to find parallels and similarities and synergies where other people only see divide and disconnection. We live in these echo chambers inside our organizations. We get lost around the same group of three to four people. We get lost in the same mini groups of people and we don't expand our minds beyond that. People with broader networks, people who had people in their lives that were very different from the other people, were actually able to provide more creative, more productive, more effective ideas and solutions in the company because they were able to look at things from multiple angles, different perspectives. How can we start to recognize that when we win and someone else wins, when we win together, when we're able to help and serve and support each other together, that so much more can happen. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, protect your purpose. In the Manu Smriti, which I talk about in Think Like a Monk, it's a monk book, and in the verse it says, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. Now, I wanna, I wanna unpack that. What I mean by that is, your purpose is like a rare jewel and a rare gemstone. And imagine you were walking around with the most expensive diamond or jewel in the world. How would you protect it? You want to just like you want to just wave wear, it out, yeah. Yeah, you want to just wear it on your chest, it's like this, like a baby, holding it. Yeah, putting a pillow around it, a blanket. You'd be like, yeah, protect it. You'd protect it. And so your purpose is like that. And guess what? Wow. People are going to tell you every day that that jewel is not worth anything. They're going to tell you that that jewel is actually valueless. It doesn't have any impact on your life. They're gonna try and take away that value. They're gonna tell you that there's another jewel out there that you need to have more value. And what ends up happening is you don't, I love the word, look at the wording, protect your purpose. You have to protect it. So what happens is your success grows, you get more opportunities, mm. more ideas, more things coming your way. Temptations. But they can all take you away from your Distractions, purpose. Yeah. Distractions. And to me, I'm repeating this for myself because I'm like, I just wanna stick to what I was born to do. And I'm so grateful that I get to do it. I'm so happy I get to do it. And I want to keep protecting it. I don't want to get lost in the waves. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to just get chucked in the waves of the ocean and just get lost and just yeah. not know where you're going. So yeah. for me, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. So that's been your biggest lesson? That's my biggest lesson. Why? Do you feel like your purpose has been maybe distracted in some I, ways? I don't or? think it has, but I'm saying it so it doesn't. Like <laughs> you're it's, reminding yourself. Yeah, I'm reminding myself. Like I'm preaching to myself right now. It's Especially like, being in Hollywood and the temptation of all these yeah, opportunities out here. Totally. And I, and I think for me it's a bigger lesson also because it gives me more faith. So I always encourage, and this is actually, actually this is why it's my biggest lesson. I encourage so many people that I coach, so many people that I mentor, obviously everyone in my community and audience and everything, to go and follow that, go and live that purpose. And I see time and time again that when I see people trying to live their purpose, they are protected, that it, things work. Mm -hmm. When you're playing in your dharma and your purpose, things work, things move, you feel momentum. They happen. They yeah. happen. And I'm not saying they happen without effort, but they happen, they move. Whereas when you're not, you just constantly feel like you're grinding up against, you know, a war. Rule number three, keep an open mind. We will continue to create the life that we currently have 
with the current set of thoughts, wisdom, beliefs, and ideas that we have. And if we're happy on that path, if you could fast forward your life in 10, 20, 30 years time, and you'd be satisfied with getting the life that you have right now, then that's great. But if like the majority of people that I know and that I speak to and that I connect with online, the majority of us would look and go, no, I really want to change life. I want to be with my kids, but I want to change how I am with them. I want to be at work, but I want to be more present at work. I want to improve the quality of my life. Then I'd say that it's so important that we learn and open up our minds to alternative thoughts. I'll give you an example. There was this great study that MIT did on people's minds, openness, and their ability to be creative and innovative. And they looked at two types of people. One person was surrounded by people who all knew the same people, right? Kind of like our normal lives. And the other person was surrounded by lots of people who didn't know each other. And they did the study around who is more creative, more innovative, and has a bigger impact in the workplace, in their professional life, and then a little bit into their personal life as well. And what they found was that those people who knew people, who knew each other, who knew them back, lived in what was known as echo chambers. They were rarely exposed to ideas that improved their way of living or their professional performance. But people who were exposed to ideas that had no connection with other people in their life were able to be more creative, have better ideas, have more purpose, have more meaning in life. So often we've become closed in our little spaces around what we hear, what we know about, and we're not exposed to this new sense of ideas. And that's what I would encourage is just approach it with a tiny bit of curiosity. That's all you need. Rule number four, know your identity. And our challenges arise by how we see ourselves. And what I believe Rangan is referring to is there's this quote that I begin my book with and that I've shared in interviews for the last few years. And it's from a writer named Charles Horton Cooley, who wrote this in the 1900s. And what he said is that Sorry, I think it's in the 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, towards the 1900s. And he said, and, and bear with me, and you've got to really listen closely to this. So what he said that, the challenge today is, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Now, just let that blow your mind for a moment. I will explain it, I promise. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am, which means we live in a perception of a perception of ourselves. So I'll break it down. If I think Rungan thinks I'm smart, I'll say I feel smart. But if I think Rungan thinks I'm not smart, then I'll say I'm not smart. And so the challenge is that we're basing how we feel about ourselves on what we think someone thinks of us. And, and the greatest challenge with that is, how do you have any idea if what you think someone thinks about you is even true and whether that's even the best place to start? So that's where our identity struggles. We start pursuing things in life because we think other people value them. It's almost like, let's think of the most playground version of this. If I remember wearing high-tech shoes from BHS to the <laughs> playground, right? I remember my mom, because my parents didn't buy me Nike uh, trainers uh, or Adidas trainers, which I always wanted. You know, we didn't come from that background. I, I couldn't, couldn't afford them and my parents didn't want to, me to have them. So I'd walk in with my high tech trainers from BHS. They were about 10 quid or whatever they were. <laughs> and, 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 you know, to me, it didn't make a difference. I didn't really know at that time whether high tech was good or bad. They were just trainers that my parents bought me. Now, everyone, the cool kid at school, had the latest Nike trainers. All of a sudden, I start thinking, that he's now surrounded by everyone. Everyone's talking about his trainers. Everyone's giving him adoration. Everyone's giving him respect. Everyone's talking about his trainers. So now I think that if I want to have that same experience and love from people, that I need to get that. Not realizing that I may be able to get deeper love from people by being kind and compassionate. That I may actually be able to build a real relationship with people if I'm loving and, and considerate and empathetic. And it's so crazy how your life can become about pursuing something. And that's why Jim Carrey puts it best. And I'm paraphrasing. He says, you know, everyone in the world should achieve everything they've ever wanted and accomplish everything they've ever pursued just to realize that it's not the point. 
Now that doesn't mean the monk mindset is not about not pursuing your goals. It's actually about pursuing your truest goals, your truest self and your most authentic aligned goals. So it's not about not having goals. It's about making sure that your goals are actually yours. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, don't take failure personally. I think one of my first things in failure is don't take it more personally than it actually is. And I'll give an example of that. When I was applying to 40 companies that all rejected me before an interview. <laughs> yeah. All I was getting was an automated response saying your application will not go any further. I can't take that personally because they didn't meet me in person. They didn't have a interaction with me. They just saw my name. They saw I'd been a monk for three years. That resume is useless. I mean, sure. what's your transferable skills? Like right. sitting in silence and stillness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Surprise, surprise, no one wants to hire a monk. And so they rejected you, but that's not personal because they didn't meet me in person. But what if they had met you in person? Right, so that's the first step. The first yeah. step is don't take all fear failure. I'll give an example. Me and you, we reach out to countless guests to be on our podcast. Mm -hmm. Who say no all the time. Who say no all the time. But if I don't hear a no from the guest directly, that's not a no. Like someone's team can say no, someone's assistant can say no, someone's PR team can say no, but until they say no personally, it's not a no. Okay, but when they do say no. Then that's a no, yeah. So then let's move so to So how that. do you deal yeah. with that type of failure? Yes, so if I deal with a failure where someone meets me in person and gets to know like, me. No, Jay, you're horrible, you <laughs> suck. Like, I don't wanna deal with a monk ever in my life. Yeah. I would never go on your show. I'm never listening to you, never. Yeah. Then how do you deal with that type of so failure? So I've heard you say this, uh, I've said it a couple of times and I'm sure it's been repeated uh -huh. a bunch of times around how I genuinely believe failure has feedback. It's feedback, and, yeah. and so for me, it's like failure has the ability to tell you what you need to improve. Now, not to improve to get their attention, improving to get the actions that you want to take. Yeah, the results you want. The results yeah. you want. And yeah. don't make that result about the person who said no. Don't try use failure as a way to prove someone else wrong. Because what happens when we prove others wrong? When you prove others wrong, you end up trying to get validation and approval for them, and now if they're not impressed when you're right, you lose again, so you end up losing twice. You, and you spend all this time and energy, years maybe, to prove someone wrong, I've been there many times, yeah. and then you're like, I felt good for a moment, yeah. and then I feel empty again. Totally, and, and so that's the thing about failure in the second half, is you have to see failure as an improvement. If, if I'm completely honest, everyone who rejected me in my life up until now has made me more hungry, taught me so much more about myself, and made me up my game. Yeah. And I think if failure doesn't make you up your game, it's the same as losing in a sport, right? When you fail and you've lost games and you've won games yeah. you know, on the big stages. You didn't have the skills, you didn't have the teamwork, you guys weren't hungry enough, you whatever it is. You weren't communicating enough. There's something you were missing. Yeah. So you go review the game film, you check the stats, you see what could I have done better, and you try to improve that for the next game. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can do that in life, but we're so afraid to like go on the next game mm -hmm. of life. Like I got rejected once and it hurts so bad. Yeah. How do people learn to overcome that pain of rejection? Yeah. To yeah. keep going. Yeah. You know, in sports, luckily there's a season which is like you might have 30 basketball games. After you lose the first two, you don't say, uh, I'm just gonna give up the rest of the season. Yeah. You keep playing. Yes. But in life, a lot of people stop playing. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think that's great mental training too. I think yeah. sports is great mental training because you have to show up to the next game even if you lost and you don't feel bad. Exactly. That you don't feel good, sorry. And, and one of the things, before I dive into that question, one of the things that you reminded me of was the, the Last Dance documentary. Mm -hmm. So there's that season that Michael Jordan, everyone is agreement, in, in agreement that he is one of the best players to be playing. And they keep losing. And they didn't make the finals. Right? They didn't right, make yeah. the finals, they lost. And then they realize they need to get the team. 
and they need to find, the, I think they're bringing Dennis Rodman and then yeah. they start bringing in all these other players that strengthen. Whereas if they would have just said, oh, we got the best player in the world, we just keep doing this. I'm not sure they would have got there, right? But the coach, Phil Jackson and the team, they had to adapt. And so you're saying, why do we feel that pain in rejection and, and mm -hmm. how do we deal with mm -hmm. that? I think we feel that pain because we look at a failure, right? We look at it as a complete definition of us, mm. right? We're looking at it as, as uh, there's that famous statement of like, you know, failure is an event, not a person. Right. And I don't know who said it, but it's one of those statements that, that really clicks. Like failure is uh, an event, not a person. Mm -hmm. Whereas we start thinking we are the failure. Mm. Like we say, I, I am, am a failure. failure. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number six, invest in your strength. If you had 100 hours to invest in your self-development, in what you were good at, what you were average at, and what you were bad at, how would you split that time? When this question was asked to 200 of the most healthy, wealthy, wise people in the world, what they found is that their percentages were 100, 0, 0, or 80, 10, 10. And the reason for this was very simple. When we focus on things we're naturally good at, and we invest in them, we become exceptional at them. When we focus on things that we're average at, we may get good at them. And when we focus on things we're naturally bad at, we may become average at them. The hard skills that we have, the actual hard, tangible skills that we have, we should focus on our strengths. But when it comes to our qualities, our emotional intelligence, we should focus on our weaknesses. So if you have a challenge with something like listening, you don't go, oh yeah, Jay told me not to focus on my weaknesses, so I'm not gonna bother getting better at my listening, right? Listening is a soft skill. If you have a weakness in a soft skill, you want to give that your energy. But if you have a strength in a hard skill, you wanna give that your energy and focus. And usually we do it the other way around. If we're bad listeners, but good at something else, we let it roll. We say, oh, that's okay, that, that's not a big deal. But when it comes to things like empathy, emotional intelligence, vulnerability, listening, communication, connection, these are things that we can improve in. And when it comes to our natural strengths, our skills, our hard skills, we can play to those as well. And when we play to our strengths, when we understand our role and our offering, and we recognize that actually that person has their offering, we recognize it's not that we disagree with each other, it's not that that person's trying to take me down, it's just that we speak different languages. We generally talk to people like they're exactly the same. And people generally talk to us like we're exactly the same. We usually expect that people will respond to things in the same way as we will. We just have this lens. Until we start recognizing that there are different wirings for different people, so they all respond to different things. And there's a beautiful statement that's often attributed to Albert Einstein where he said that everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. And so many of us in our own life are either trying to be something or we're connecting with people differently. All of us can mindfully approach any conversation in the workplace, with a partner, potentially even with a patient or wherever it is, understanding that person's language. The point being that everyone was trying to achieve the same goal. And I want you to do that. I want you to give yourself the benefit of the doubt and the people around you that everyone is trying to work towards the same goal. If we can just learn to speak each other's language, then we'll be able to improve our communication. Rule number seven, learn how to block time. You can't be logical and creative at the same time. Your brain and mind is using different faculties and different abilities to do different types of tasks. Imagine you're in meetings all day about numbers and data and analytics, and all of a sudden you're asked to do something creative. Maybe write a speech or give a presentation. It can be really, really difficult to switch from one side of your brain to the other side in a matter of seconds. With very little organizing and planning, we're literally going like a pendulum, swinging from one task to another, which is requiring different parts of our brain and the abilities that we have. The way I solve this is that I start every day by first writing down my to-do list. I look at all the activities that I have to do. Now in the examples I give in this video, I've simplified my task to make it easier, but know that I do this with a lot more detail. You want to draw a line down the middle of the page, on one side of it write logical, and on the other side of it write creative. You now want to plot and mark where these tasks on your to-do list fit 
either in the logical category or in the creative category. The question you're asking yourself is, is this task largely structured, focused? Does it have certain boundaries? Is it quite a logical step-by-step -step process? Or is this creative? Is it more of a brainstorm? Is it somewhere where you need to feel free and express it? After you've divided these tasks, you now want to write down the time estimate that that specific task is going to take. What ends up happening is you start to plot your week by saying Monday is going to be creative, Tuesdays are logical, Wednesdays are logical, Thursdays are creative, and Fridays are creative. Or you may also divide your day up into logical mornings and creative afternoons or creative mornings and logical afternoons. This division, this time blocking, allows you to get really immersed into the activity, really focus, and be more productive and effective. Rule number eight, find your values. One of my favorite ways to start is looking at what we value. And values are a very intangible word, and so there's a very easy way to figure out what you value. There's two things you have to look at. You look at how you spend your money, the most painful thing you can possibly do, go through your bank statement and look at where your money is being spent. That is what you value. The other thing that we spend, just like we spend money, is how we spend our time. Those are the two most perfect ways to see what you currently value. Your value isn't what's in your head, isn't what's in your heart, it isn't what's in your mind, it's how you spend your money and how you spend your time. And so, just to give you an overview, and I share this in the book, that research was done on how we spend our time. And the research showed that we spend 33 years in bed, right? 33 years of our life in bed. And seven years of that is spent trying to sleep, not even sleeping, right? We spend one year and four months exercising across our whole lives, these are, by the way. We spend more than three years on vacation. Uh, and we spend a bunch of days trying to get ready and we spend a bunch of time, you know, standing in lines and queues and so much of our time just gets spent. So the question we have to ask ourselves is where am I currently spending my time and where do I want to spend it? Now studies also show that people, everyone has to go to work. So this isn't about what you do for work. People who had more meaningful, purposeful lives and were healthier, wealthier, and wise, invest their time in education over entertainment. And Rangan, your, your audience is lucky because they get education and entertainment in one place, but, but that's the goal, right? Like that's the goal, that you're creating an opportunity for people to find education. The, the smartest, the wealthiest, the most healthiest, the wisest people in the world, were reading books, watching documentaries, taking courses, listening to podcasts, learning to better themselves. And so that's the first place to start. The second place, when we look at that value audit, is I want you to write down three things that you're currently pursuing in life. It might be a promotion, it might be a new home, whatever it is, whatever it is that you are currently pursuing. And then I want you to ask this question. Is that your desire and your dream or is it coming from something outside of you? Is it coming from a pressure of a family member? Is it coming from an expectation because your friend just bought something? Where is that desire truly coming from? And the third and final question you want to ask yourself is, do I still want to pursue that? Or do I want to change how I pursue it? Or do I not want to pursue it at all? And if you go through that three-step questioning process, you'll get to the truth of what you truly want to pursue and stop yourselves from building a sandcastle which the waves of time will eventually wash away. And so that's yeah. what we get lost doing. We get lost building castles that we don't even want to live in. Rule number nine, do habit stacking. Here's a way that you can actually get more out of the same time. I learned this from my good friend, Ariana Huffington, who speaks about habit stacking. Now we all have habits in our life that we do every single day without even thinking about it. We're driving around town. We're cooking every single day. We may be on a walk. These are great times to immerse in those activities for sure. When you're driving to be fully present, if you're going on a hike, to be really there within nature. And if you're cooking, to be really present with the scents, the sounds, and, and all of the different colors that may be there. But if you're someone who can do some of those things pretty comfortably, you can also add a stack of a habit. 
So for example, you may be someone who listens to an audiobook while driving. You may be someone that listens to a podcast while cooking or while you're on a hike or walking the dog. It's okay to habit stack in those scenarios to get more out of the same amount of time. I wrote about this in my book. It's called Location Has Energy, Time Has Memory. When you do something in the same place every day, at the same time every day, that space builds an energy and that time builds a memory. What does that mean? When you've done something in one place, like meditated in the same place for a considerable amount of time, that space takes on a meditative energy and frequency. It becomes easier to do that activity in that place. And similarly, when you do something at the same time every day, that time has a memory. Your body, your mind remember that and therefore it becomes easier to do. Divide your home, even in corners. I remember when my wife and I lived in a 500 square foot apartment and literally every corner of that room was divided into a meditation corner, a social corner, a work corner, and an eating corner. Even that differentiation allowed you to keep the energy of that space sacred and appropriate for what you want to do. The challenge today is we eat where we're meant to sleep. We sleep where we're meant to work and we work where we're meant to eat. So we've confused the energy of our environment. That's why we're sitting in bed and can't sleep because we do so many different activities there. Remove that energy from the bedroom, place it where it needs to be, and allow yourself to see how you use your time more effectively in that place. And number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is keep on moving. One of my favorite ways to deal with success is continue trying to be the least successful person in the room that you and I think there's those statements of like, you know, never Always be the, the dumbest person. Yeah, never be the smartest person in the room, et cetera. And I think it's the same with, if you become successful, don't just stand at the top of the mountain, don't just stand at the top of the building, go back down the stairs and, and keep building and keep living as that person that got you there because you only got there because you started from the bottom. Right, no one starts at the top, mm. and so you started at the bottom and you built it up, and it was that mindset that you started with that got you there. And so you wanna keep rediscovering that mindset and new parts of it, and new parts of that mindset too, where you're always trying to challenge yourself. Mm. And so for me, one of the best ways of dealing with success is keep expanding the goalposts, right? Keep widening the goalposts, keep making them harder to reach and challenging yourself, because when you challenge yourself, and you push yourself out of your comfort zone, you're naturally humbled. Mm -hmm. Because you're naturally humbled when you're walking into spaces. I'm sure you feel this sometimes. Like sometimes I walk into a room and I'm like, how did I even get here? Yeah. Right? Like sitting I'm, on a table, I'm like, I'm the why should I be here? Yeah, like and, and there's part of it that's imposter syndrome and that can have its own negativity, but part of that just lets me feel like a beginner again. Yeah. And I appreciate that feeling and I go, This is amazing because learning to be grateful and stop just thinking that, oh, I earned all of this and I did it all myself and I'm self-made. You start recognizing gratitude for all the people that yeah. got you there. So for me in success, first thing is be grateful for all your teachers, mentors, guides, people that got you there. The second thing is always keep challenging yourself because the more you're out of your comfort zone, the more naturally you stay humble. You don't stay humble by trying to be humble. You become humbled constantly right. by trying to do stuff that's out of your league, which constantly makes you prepare, work, deepen Study, what you Study, all that stuff. All of that stuff that makes you go there again. And, and then the third thing you do with success is I think you try and share it with others. Mm. You try and use your platforms as an opportunity to give other people a platform yeah. so that they can come up as well because you're reminded of what a beautiful gift you have. 